Good afternoon and welcome to the Garden Angelus where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Dean Ash from Guthrie, Oklahoma. And I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana. Hi, Dee. Howdy, Carol. How are you this afternoon? It's a glorious, beautiful day. I am great. Well, I can't say it's a glorious, beautiful day in Oklahoma, but we did get a lot of rain. I meant to look at my rain gauge. I bet we got two inches last night and this morning, and that makes it a pretty glorious day. Yay. Everything is blooming, and I, I just can't believe that it's spring finally. Yeah, it feels like spring is doing this fits and starts kind of thing this year. Even here, it's 55 degrees today, and that's that's quite chilly for the end of April. But, you know, that's okay. We will get heat soon enough, it, so I'm going to take it. It was 77 yesterday here, but it's only 67 right now. We'll probably get to 70. Well, good for you guys. I bet we get to 60 today. Isn't that funny that I can be south of you and it actually be cooler depending on when the cold fronts come through? And that probably means that later this week it's going to be cooler for me. Probably so. And sorry about that. That's all I got to say. But these are the kind of days that cause people to get really antsy about getting things planted and in the ground. And People mm-hmm. of Indiana, listen to me. It's still too early to plant the warm season stuff. But, yeah, people of Oklahoma, you can now plant, but, you know, watch those watch those highs at nighttime because you want it to be 55 degrees or higher before you plant things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, you know, those really, really non-hardy vegetables. Exactly. And I, I went to my little greenhouse today. Because I wanted to take pictures of the flower we're going to talk about. And I found out that the one that I want is in short supply. So I now blame you, Dee, for me buying petunias so early. (laughs) I think it's funny that you blame me, but, you know, you just can't help yourself. No. And uh, so let's talk about petunias, our flower today. First, let's talk about where are you going to store those petunias since you can't plant them out yet. Those petunias are going to be uh, on my back patio where I will remember to water them and watch them. And I'll, I'll nurture them on. I'll probably end up planting them earlier. But the problem is they go in the containers that have the pansies and violas in them. And the pansies and violas are gorgeous. And there's no way I'm ripping them out yet. So Mm-mm. I'm just going to kind of keep them going as best I can. And they'll be fine. I'll keep them watered. Just like the greenhouse did. Yeah, exactly. Because you're basically creating kind of a greenhouse thing for them. Um, I have a petunia story. You want to hear Of course I want to hear your petunia story. I can't wait. So in 2000... (laughs) I don't know if it's that good a story, but in 2015, I got to go with the National Garden Bureau to something called California Spring Trials, which I had never heard of before 2015, but now I follow along eagerly every year because I've been to it. It was one of the best trips of my life. Um, We went around from wholesale garden company, wholesale greenhouse, wholesale greenhouse, wholesale greenhouse, and California Spring Trials is where everybody, whether it's an independent garden center, a broker for them, or a broker for the big three box stores, They all go to California Spring Trials, and they look at all the plants that are on offer, and they make their decision about what they're going to buy and put into greenhouses for you, the consumer, in about two years. So it's two years ahead. And so there are things that I saw at California Spring Trials that that just now are actually on the market, even though it's three years, it takes a long time for something to grab hold on the market. And one of the things that we saw, so we traveled from Los Angeles all the way up to San Francisco with a group of other bloggers, and it was so much fun. Um, We went up there, and so as we traveled through the state, we looked at both seed companies and what they call vegetative companies. Those are the people who, you know, they make plants by cutting them and making new ones. And so... It was it was just an amazing thing, but by the end of the trip, I thought if I ever see another stinking petunia again, I'm going to die because I saw, I can't describe how many petunias. Every single company has petunias, hordes of petunias. So we were just really sick of them, but one of the petunias we saw that year 
and they, it had a big splash. I mean, it was, it had its own booth. It was the petunia is one you bought. Night sky. Night sky. Night sky was... And we'll post pictures of night sky petunia. It is really dramatic. It is a dark, dark purple with white splotches all over it. And then there's a pink version. Yeah. Is it? What's the name of the pink version? Pink sky. And it's a dark pink with white splotches. And I bought 10 of each. Well, that's going to be pretty. That's going to be really pretty in your pots. Um, I also that year saw the super tunia honey. And um, honey is one of my very favorite petunias. It's kind of a yellow, and then it fades to a pink. So it's very pretty. Now, as soon as this podcast is over, I feel like i got to go back to the greenhouse and see if they have super tunia honey. Well, we're going to talk about a few others, too, so you might just want to wait. You know what? They're good friends of mine now. I just Facebook message them and say, do you have, do you have, do you have, do you have? <laughs> that way you don't have to go over there and be tempted by all the other plants, right? <laughs> I'll go over I go over almost every day from now until Memorial Day. I got to go. So you want to know which petunia was one of the number one petunias? It had been out for a while, but it was one of the ones that was planted. It still is planted everywhere. What petunia would that be? Uh, I don't know. Supertunia Vista Bubblegum. Oh, yes, I've seen that one. Yeah, Supertunia Vista Bubblegum. And we should talk a little bit about, okay, Supertunias... It's a registered trademark uh, by Proven Winners or someone affiliated with Proven Winners. And Super Tunias, they, they have Super Tunias and then they have Super Tunia Vista type. And the Vista type are spreading type petunias. And two that I think of off the top of my head are Bubblegum and Silverberry. Silverberry is white and has a dark throat that's kind of purple. Uh-huh. It looks really, really good with uh, Purple Heart for Tradescantia. It looks really good with it. Um, that's a great combination. So, and super easy. Like you can't, you cannot hurt them at all. And so when you are looking at petunias, when you go to the store, whether you go to your independent garden center or you go to a, you know, one of the box stores that carries proven winners, the ones that are just super petunias are more of a mounting habit that stay in place. Right. The Avista ones Spread like wildfire. They don't really spread, but they have very, very long stems, and so they look that way. And then you thought of a plant of a petunia that had been that was out before yes. Super Petunia Vista that also had really long stems. Yes, I remember, and I'm thinking it was in the early '90s. The wave petunia came out. Did it come out that early? Oh, it's been a Gosh, while. Gosh, I don't know. It's been a long time. I will say that. A long, long time. And you can always spot wave petunias at the store because they're always in a hot pink package. Yes. Hot pink. And they tend to be tangled up. And so they were really... (laughs) They do. I'm laughing because... You almost made me spit out my tea. But yes, it is like like a hard, hard thing to get them all untangled. Right. So when they would sell them in flats, the the grower... um, it was a different greenhouse, but she said the problem was that they were really best bought when they were smaller and hadn't started to really vine and flower because once they started vining and flowering, that flat was really hard to tease out the individual plants, and so people would basically maul the plants to try to and break them to try to get one. So now they, right. they sell them a lot in six-packs. With a handle. Mm -hmm. I see them in six packs and 12 packs. And they have the handle and they're pretty easy to get out now. Right. And they are good. They are good petunias, especially the original one. They're very good. And the the thing is, though, the original wave petunia could spread three to four feet. Mm -hmm. And was it was purple. Yeah, kind of a hot purple. purple. Yes. And they're from Ball Horticulture. And since then, they've been breeding them, and now they have Cool Wave, which goes to about 30 inches, Shock Wave, Easy Wave, uh, Tidal Wave. And Tidal Wave, they say, can grow out five Yeah, feet. Tidal Wave is, is huge. And you know what? They were, I want to say that Tidal Wave was at the California Spring Trials when I was there, so I remember Right, and then there's double wave, which is sort of frilly petals mm-hmm. and flowers. It makes it a little bit bigger, nicer for a basket. So 
when people go to buy the waves, it's it's really hard now sometimes to find the original wave because they've got all these others. And we'll put a link to these. So when you go to the store and you see cool wave, shock wave, the EBC wave, tidal wave, double wave, and wave, you'll know what Here you're a wave, getting. there a wave, everywhere a wave. Everywhere yeah. a wave. Um, also, I wanted to say that there's another group of um, petunias out there called sweet tunia. And I'm growing one of those this year called Fiona Flash. And then on t- and that one is actually put out by another company called, and I can't think of it right now, is it Drum and Orange? Is that right? Doom, Doom, and, Doom and Orange. Orange. I said it wrong. Doom and Orange. And then there's another petunia out there that is put out by Proven Winners that's part of their Crazy Tunia series, and it's Moonstruck. And I have fallen head over heels for Crazy Tunia Moonstruck, which is hard to say. Um, beautiful, beautiful plant. But here's the thing about petunias in Oklahoma. Some petunias do better than others. If you choose the Super Tunia Vista type, you can almost be assured that they will do just fine. But if you want to have success with petunias in Oklahoma, there's a couple of things you need to do. And maybe you need to do these for Indianapolis also. Um, I like to grow them in containers. I have grown them in the ground, but um, I think it's a lot easier to grow them in containers. And you need I'd agree. you need to feed them. Uh, we talk a lot yep. about, we're going to talk some more about containers in this episode. But petunias especially appreciate a good feeding uh, you don't have to deadhead these new petunias anymore. Thank you. They're called self-cleaning. Yeah, thank goodness for self-cleaning petunias um, because I hated deadheading them, and they never, ever looked as good, you know? And they're very sticky. They're very sticky when you deadhead them. Which is why deer don't like them. They're fuzzy and sticky, no. and so deer won't eat them. So they're they're a pretty, pretty deer-proof plant. I don't say any plant is completely deer-proof because if a hungry deer comes through your neighborhood, no telling what's going to happen, but they don't like petunias. Um, They want sunlight and they want, not the deer, maybe they like sunlight too, but the petunias want sunlight and they want drip irrigation in Oklahoma because I don't think you can water them enough here. Yeah, they need quite a bit of water. I I water, I don't have drip irrigation. I'm not fancy like y'all, but I try to water them every day. And also, you get kind of past like the 4th of July, and I find that if you shear them up a little bit, because yep. they start to get a little bit leggy, so you shear them off a bit and kind of re, I guess, I don't know, reinvigorate them, and then they'll put out new growth. Yeah, you'll have new, gro- new growth for fall. Yeah, you'll have, the, as it cools down, they'll start blooming better again. So I'd say yeah. don't prune off any more than maybe 20%, you know, because you're just trying to get them shaped back up unless it's the, i would agree unless it's that tidal wave i don't know what you do with that thing. Yeah. i might try to find it Ooh, you should you should try to find it and grow it i don't think my growers got tidal wave she does have crazy tunia moonstruck and i was down there taking mm. pictures of them and i almost bought crazy tunia moonstruck and i thought i need to now i need to go back that is the crazy that tunia is the moonstruck I've done the the party dress one, which I really liked. I've done a bunch of the crazy tunias, and some I like better than others. But that Moonstruck, if it does well in my pots this year, uh, it's going to be a long-term love affair because that dark purple with that golden edge, I I think it's gorgeous. And then Fiona Flash is really pretty too. Um, we'll see how it does. I do, we'll see, we'll just see. So have we pretty much talked petunias to death? We have, except can I tell a petunia story? Absolutely. So the first thing I want to tell people is people remember petunias from when, you know, they were kids and those did have to be deadheaded or they wouldn't bloom. And my dad always had those. And so he would deadhead them and everything. And this is kind of a story about my dad, the gardener, and my mom, not the gardener. So they had just moved to their first little place where they were growing some petunias outside. And she was staying home with my older sister, and she asked if there was anything she could do out in the garden to help, and he said, you can deadhead the petunias. And Uh so she said, okay. So she said she went out there, and she did what she thought was deadheading the petunias. And then my dad comes home, and he says, who cut all the flower buds off the petunia? Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So she didn't quite recognize that the flower bud was the bud and not the spent flower. And that was the beginning and end of her gardening career. 
Yeah, kind of like when Bill burned my uh, roses. But he's decided he is a gardener now, so I don't know what to think about that. He may become a beekeeper this year, too. Oh, well, so self-cleaning petunias might have turned my mom into a gardener. You know, because she wouldn't have had to do them. And that's a... She wouldn't have had to go out there and make that mistake. Like gardeners don't make mistakes. We make plenty. But you know what? When you're new, you you think you have to do it perfectly. And then after you do it for a while, you go, uh, yeah. <laughs> None of it's perfect. Well, you know, so there are, like you said, you saw probably hundreds of new petunia varieties hundreds. when you went to California spring tiles. Mm-hmm. And so maybe the next big uh, wave of petunias is going to be going back to those old traditional ones that we grew in the 60s. Oh, gosh, I hope not, because these are great. Comparatively, <laughs> it's a totally different deal. Yeah, it is. So now I think we've talked enough about petunias. Okay, let's talk about container gardening. I got all my container... Yeah, since we were talking about that. (laughs) We were talking about that for petunias. Well, we were, but now we're going to get into the specifics, right? Okay, yes. Okay, so the first thing about containers, you need really good ones that you can, you know, you pick your choice, and there's a lot of different types. And Carol, you want to run down the types of containers? So we thought of several. There's plastic. There's some made out of a composite material, terracotta, glazed ceramic, uh, fabric pots. Uh, The most common brand around is Smart Pots. There's self-watering pots. And then we called them alternative containers, things like um, kitchen colanders, old old toy trucks, old wagons, stock tanks. (laughs) Redwood elevated planters, whiskey barrels, and then I've got my new elevated garden, which is plastic. Mm-hmm. So there are there's there is a container for every single style and every single gardener out there. Yes, there is. So whatever kind of thing you want to do, whether you want to repurpose things or or collect. In my case, I've collected glazed containers for years. Um, I like glazed containers because I can overwinter them outside. And they don't have to be watered as often as, say, terracotta. In fact, I would not suggest terracotta for almost everyone unless you grow stuff in the shade and um, you're willing to go out there and water twice a day, every day in the summertime, which most of us will forget and then your thing will die in terracotta. But glazed ceramic does great. You don't have to bring it inside. It doesn't crack as long as the top is glazed. You know, you'll see some glazed ceramic right. where it isn't. the top isn't glazed and it has a porous material, and so it's more likely to crack. Um, I also really like the smart pots for vegetables. I grow my potatoes in those. I do too. I have uh, two bags of uh, potatoes growing outside. And I was going to say, I have three, no, I have five big composite containers. These, these are 24-inch containers. And I've kept them outside in Indiana, and I think this is their fifth year. And mm-hmm. what I do to keep them from getting a bunch of water and snow in them and freezing and thawing, which I think would probably be the end of them, is I put black plastic trash bags over the top of them. Right. And then... That's smart. In the spring, I just use those trash bags to for trash. Yeah. <laughs> or to put your dead material in as you drag it to a compost pile or whatever. Right, right. Um, the... Th- the thing is, and so what you're saying is, and I th- at least what I think you're saying is, you don't replace all of your potting soil in your containers every year. Heavens no. Okay, let's talk about that a little bit and about what, what we use in our containers to grow plants. Because a lot of people think that you can dig dirt out of the garden and put it in containers and that will work. Will that work? That will not work. That'll just... Um, no. the. Around here, you'd be digging up a bunch of clay, and it'd just be a big rock by the end of the summer. Mm -hmm. We'd have clay or we'd have sand. And the truth of the matter is it doesn't drain properly, and so you just it it would be a mess. But I can see why people do it or think to do it because it seems logical. I mean, if it works in the ground, it should work in your container, but it doesn't. But, D, what does clay and sand make? It makes cement. Exactly. And bricks. And bricks. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. don't don't be mixing those two in a container. 
No, don't. Okay, and so the other thing is, so I I like um, a couple of different potting soils. I use one from a local nursery here that they make themselves that has rice rice bran holes in it. Um, but I also of national brands. I really like Happy Frog because Happy Frog has earthworm castings, bat guano, and what they call aged forest products. I call it compost inside of it. Um, I also love the black gold brand of natural and organic. So I do both of those. And one of the things I like about the black gold version is that they have smaller bags that have handles. And if you've ever lugged around a ton of bags of potting soil is heavy guys. And when it gets rained on, it's really heavy and you get tired. So I, I like the fact that they have handles and smaller smaller bags because I hoist mine up on the deck. I have a deck off my house, right? And I have to go up and down steps. That's yeah, you got a lot to carry there. Um, I don't remember the brand I have out there. And when I first filled up these pots, I just went to the greenhouse around the corner and said, "What are you putting in your containers?" And I bought some bags off of her, but those weren't necessarily organic. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to um, probably once the pansies and violas are done, I'm probably going to dig out a bunch of that and replace it with an organic potting mix because I found some at a local store that I really like. And um, I don't know that brand is as important as the uh, OMRI certification. Yeah, the OMRI certification. And so just to remind our listeners, OMRI stands for Organic Materials Review Institute. And this is a private nonprofit organization that will certify whether a product qualifies as a um, organic product based on the U.S. Department of Agriculture's National Organic Program. So I look for <laughs> OMRI, OMRI, on the bag to mm-hmm. show me that it's certified organic. And I really like what I just bought at the local big box store, so big box hardware store. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter where you buy it or what kind you buy particularly. I just like Happy Frog because it has a lot of composted material in it. And we should also quickly say that potting soil usually has peat moss in it or it has core. And I've noticed um, in a lot of the – because I just bought a whole bunch of plants and planted out all my pots. I noticed that a lot of brands, big-name brands – of containers, you know, the actual plants, that they are now using Quar as part of their product. You can tell the difference in the texture when you take right. it out of the pot. So that's probably good news. I mean, I don't want to get into a long thing about potting soil and um, peat moss today, but we are trying to use less as a nation because we use a lot of it. But you can also, when you are done with your potting soil, you can put it in your compost and just make it part of your you know, matter that you add back to your soil. It ain't going to hurt right. anything. Now, one of the don't things, throw it away. Don't throw it away. One of the things listeners will find out on the market is potting soils that contain uh, moisture pellets or moisture Oh, the retaining. moisture beads. Moisture beads. I couldn't mm-hmm. think what they were called. I'm not a fan of moisture beads. It's just one more piece of... I don't of, like them. It's just one more piece of gunk that you probably don't need because if you're watering properly... You've got a nice big container. It doesn't really do anything. And it just, you, I wouldn't put that back onto my garden then. Oh, no, I would not either. If you're buying moisture control uh, potting soil, uh, just stop. Because <laughs> you don't need those moisture beads. They aren't good for anything, and they don't really work. They've done some studies that say that they don't work. Now, I haven't looked up those studies today, but I have read them in the past. Um, here's the deal. If you use drip irrigation or you go out and water your pots once or twice a day in the middle of summer when it's super hot and you use large enough pots, you don't need moisture control anyway. Exactly right. what Carol said. One, okay. Well, there's a couple other things we've got to warn people about with containers. Okay. First of all, um, you look in the magazine and they've got like some cute old Tonka truck toy that they've planted in or a chick or a colander. And if you plant in something like that, you should consider it something like a long-lived flower arrangement because that's not a good long-term container for most plants to thrive. And so it's kind of cute to do if you have like a big 4th of July party and you want to put some stuff in wagons and sort of cutesy things up. Treat them like flower Mm -hmm. arrangements and then 
they won't last all that long. Yeah, exactly. They're just decor. Just they decor. aren't really, yeah, they aren't really gardening. It's just decor, and there's a difference, and that's okay. You know, yeah. decor planted, is great. I planted in cute stuff, and then after a while, it's like, yeah, that plant's not doing so good. Yeah, move it. Move it to something where it can breathe. Exactly. And then one other thing to tell people is if you're going to grow vegetables in containers, and it's it works if you get the right kind of vegetable, but don't buy a container made out of any kind of treated wood because you don't know what um, chemicals they use to treat the wood, and those chemicals can leach into the soil and then end up in your vegetables. And yeah, eventually your beds, if you build raised beds, for example, eventually the wood will rot because you aren't using treated wood. But the, here's the thing. You don't want to have that whatever they treated that wood with in your in your vegetables and food you eat. So use untreated wood. Hey, Dee, I think now it's time to talk about weeds, which you don't get a lot of in containers, but you do in the regular garden. Yeah, my garden is a big, fat, weedy mess right now. How about yours? Um... I'm digging weeds every single day. Yeah. It's Shakespeare's birthday today, so I have a quote from Shakespeare. Go for it. Sweet flowers are slow and weeds make haste. Boy, isn't that the truth. You know what? Stuff that you want to grow, sometimes it won't grow at all. But weeds, there's no problem growing those all the time. No, no problem at all. And so um, what's your worst weeds right now, today? Oh, today, right now, I have one called sticky weed. I, I did not look up all the botanical names for these weeds. Chickweed, garlic mustard, thistle, and shotweed, and field bindweed, and Bermuda grass, and oak tree acorns. All of those are growing in my garden right now as we speak. Well, I don't have Bermuda grass. Lucky you. I don't think it's, and I don't know what shotweed is. Um, we'll link to shotweed because one of my friends who actually lives up in Seattle fights it all the time too. It starts out and it looks like this little dainty, little frilly bottom to the weed. And then it has these little, t little stems that go up and it has little tiny white flowers. But here's why it's called shotweed. Those little flowers are gone very fast and in their place are these bullet-like seeds and if you touch that weed when it's gone to seed it shoots right into your face i hate that stuff that sounds terrible <laughs> it is pretty terrible and oak tree acorns are pretty terrible too because that means i have little tiny oak trees all over my garden because i live in an oak forest there you go so uh i also have garlic mustard and i pulled it out of both my front and back garden so it's it's an invasive did you eat it? Nope. <laughs> uh, our friend Ellen Zakos is going to listen to this and be horrified the fact that we pulled out garlic mustard and thrown it in the trash like a common weed. Because it is. And didn't make, and didn't make pesto, out, pesto out of it. Oh, well. What else, what else is bothering you right now? Well, you know, um, Indiana just passed a law about invasive plants that we're not allowed to sell anymore. Oh, they hallelujah. left off. Well, they left off the calorie pear, also known as Bradford pear, Whoa. also known as Cleveland street tea. They left that off the list because the nurserymen were like, but we have so much to sell. Oh, that's so too I'm bad cool. because, man, that tree, we have them all through, like up by Tulsa, Oklahoma, all through the forests. That tree has gone rogue. Yeah, it's gone rogue. And I pulled up several seedlings of that out of my garden. Um, I'm also pulling out thistle, and I'm digging out dandelions. Digging out dandelions. Yeah, because we don't want dandelions to grow in our garden beds. We don't care if they're in the lawn, but we really don't want them in our garden beds. They're fine in the back lawn. Bees yeah. are loving them. And uh, also, I, I forgot to mention elm trees. Our native, I have native elms out here, too, and I pull up elms all the time. In fact, I always miss one or two, and right now I noticed in a shade garden that I have a giant elm tree I'm going to have to either dig out or cut below the surface of the soil. You know, I never completely get rid of it. But if you cut it below the soil enough times, it decides usually to give it up. Yeah, and I, I, uh, I noticed a dandelion the other day that I was digging out, and it was in a flower bed. But the bloom on that was almost two inches across. 
That's a and big I thought, dandelion. If I, if I was breeding dandelions to make a bigger, better dandelion, I would take that that bloom that was almost two inches across, and I would try to find that one that I tried to dig out that had a three foot tall flower spike. Can you imagine if I created like a super dandelion like that? I think people that would, would kill me. People would kill you unless they ate it. I mean, maybe for edible greens, but good grief, dandelions are hard enough to control as it is. Oh, yeah. Maybe it just they, likes they, your really fertile soil. I guess, but I was <laughs> like, I'm really proud of this dandelion, how big this flower is. So we have a few, we have a few tips about weeds, and one of the things, here's the thing, even if you use, we aren't going to say the name, but if, even if you use that product, that um, people use on weeds, that broad spectrum weed killer. Um, you're still it starts with R. Yes, yeah, starts, starts with, with an R. R. <laughs> Ends with P. Um, you're still going to have to pull the weeds out, so you might as well not yes. use it. However, I did find an Omri listed certified. It's Omri certified weed killer that is made by Ortho, and I think it's relatively new because I've never seen it before this year. I found it at the box store. It's called Ortho Ground Clear. And there are two kinds of Ortho Ground Clear. One has glyphosate in it, and that's not the one you want. The other one has ammonium nanoate. And so ammonium nanoate is a soap. And it has a very short half-life. It's not supposed to be harmful to humans. And so here's my advice about it. I have used it in my... I tested it in my paths because I have gravel paths and what grows better than anything else? Gravel grows weeds. So I did spray some in my paths and it did kill. It does not kill like that other unnamed thing, but um, use it with caution. If you're going to use it, use it with caution because it is a broad spectrum herbicide. For one thing, it'll kill anything it comes in contact with as far as plants go. So I wouldn't spray it in my beds. Just pull those weeds. And when you're pulling a weed, we have techniques for you. Yes. So if it's an annual weed, like chickweed, and I have purple dead nettle, also henbit, the main thing on that is just to, to pull the weed. You don't have to worry about getting all the roots, although they're pretty shallow rooted because they're annuals, so they've grown up from seed in the spring. Right. And... You want to get those before they've set seed, and in my case, I put them in the trash because I don't want them to, the flower to have any chance of maturing in my compost bin. Right. So you're saying that your compost isn't hot enough to it's perhaps not. kill the seeds, right? So you put yours in right. the trash. Right. And, then, and our trash in Indianapolis is incinerated. So I think about those weeds dying a fiery death. Yes, Makes me happy. It does me too. Just the thought of it. I wish that we incinerated our trash in Oklahoma, but I think we just put it in big piles. Um, okay, and then perennial weeds, there are some that spread out. I think shotweed is one of those. And then there are ones with tap roots like dandelions. And, and with, thistle. And thistle. And so you want to get all of that tap root. And the easiest <laughs> way... To, That's funny, D. <laughs> yeah, Exactly. You can't get it all. But you want to try to get as much as you possibly can. So how do you do it? How do you well, try to I, it? Well, I either use my soil knife or I use an old-fashioned dandelion digger, and I just kind of stab around all sides of that taproot and then just pull it out as best I can. Right. Pretty much the same method here. And, um, but you want to get as close to the surface of the soil with your hand as possible and get all around that weed as you're doing all that loosening of the taproot and then pull all kind of in one motion because if you twist it or you pull too high on the leaves or whatever you're going to have trouble with it because it's not going to come out right it's not going to come out clean you're, you're going to end up with a handful of leaves which you know if you got a big garden tour tomorrow that may be what you got to do just to make things presentable but if you're trying to get rid of them you got to dig them yeah you got to dig them so that's, a, that's another way. And then roots that spread out, same thing. Bindweed, honest to goodness, uh, bindweed's roots go to China. So you aren't ever going to get it all out. And they're stretchy. When you pull on them, they're kind of stretchy. And you have to pull those weeds. 
And I think the thing with bindweed is to just um, keep at it. Keep yeah, just at keep it. at it. And then if you see some sprout up, you can spray it with that Omri certified weed killer because um, that might help you too. The same thing with, um, there's some things like uh, Southern... Um, Southern sorry. what, D? <laughs> um, I can't think of a Southern word. What? Oh, Southern what? Southern what? Good old huh? honeysuckle. Regular old, oh. common. It's not Southern. I just thought of Southern because... So it grows a lot in the south, oh. and it's invasive in the south. Good Japanese old honeysuckle. fashion Japanese honeysuckle. The worst invasive here. Yeah, invasive where I live too, and I still have some in my yard, even though I've been trying to get rid of it for thirty years. Um, it was some that Bill brought over from his grandmother's garden, and it is impossible to get rid of. I have dug it up, I've sprayed it, I've done everything that you can think of for it, and nothing works. Yeah, and D, I, I reached behind my, my, uh, um, into my bookcase, and I pulled out the Horticulturalist Rule Book by Liberty Hyde Bailey, and it's from 1908. And I tell people that in this book contains the secret for keeping your garden weed free. Never plant it. No, that's not the secret. The Bend over a is, lot and reach down and pull out the weeds? What did you say that secret was? <laughs> Bend over and reach down and pull out the weeds every single day? Yes. Actually, it's he copied Loudon's Rules for Gardeners. Yeah. And it's rule number seven. Never okay. pass a weed or insect without pulling it up or taking it off unless time forbid. It's that time forbid that's the problem. Yeah, for sure. But I joke and I tell people, and all of us gardeners have done it, you see a big weed and you know that big weed is there and you walk by it and you think, I'm going to pick it now. i got to pull it out now while it's little, but you don't have time. And then you walk by again and you walk by again. And the next thing you know, that weed is humongous. And, and, you're it's, gonna have setting, to get a, and it's setting, setting seed. And it's got a taproot to China, and you're going to have to have tools and extra strength to dig it out because you just didn't pull it when it was little. Okay, but Carol, I garden an acre and a half, and I can promise you I miss a few weeds. Oh, I garden, uh, I guess it's a third of an acre with a house on it, so I miss a few weeds too. Yeah, they, there's no way to catch them all. So just do your best. Take a lot of time for it. And I think we're going to have a special episode just on weeding where you can weed along with us. That's right. I'm working on it now, Dee, and I'm very excited about it. That's a I think, future podcast. I think that one will be fun. People could just take us out with them to weed as often as they want to. Exactly. We're going to be the Jane Fonda Workout of Weeding podcast. Awesome. I like it. So, so does that bring us to our dirt now that we've talked about weeds? Yeah, brings us to dirt. You want to talk about dirt? Well, really, it's your book. You're the one who picked out the book, so I think that you should start talking about it. Well, I read a book last week called Never Home Alone, From Microbes, Microbes to Millipedes by Rob Dunn. And it's all about, and he says there's over 200,000 species of bacteria, fungi, molds, insects, spiders, that live in your home with you. All the time. And so some people are kind of creeped out by that. And I, I was telling some of my family members about it on Easter, and they're like, oh, I am not reading that. I do not know, want to know who's living in my house with me. I'm like, oh, yeah, you do. You do want to know. Yeah, I think you because do. I, you know what? This doesn't gross me out at all. I live in the country, and I can tell you after moving out here 30 years ago when I married Bill... I have seen so many different insects, and I've seen what they do. And you know what? There's different insects in the country than there are in the city house. Like, I don't have roaches, for example, and people in the city often have roaches. But I have a lot of spiders, a lot of spiders. Well, he wrote in the book about how in some African countries, they actually encourage spiders to live in their houses 
with big spider webs in the corner because the spiders reduce the, the fly population. Yeah, they reduce all kinds of, like, you know those little, um, those little mites that, no, the little um, fruit flies that get into everything? Spiders take right. care of those very quickly. And, yeah, occasionally, I, I'll be honest, I have let a spider live in the corner of my house just so I could watch the process. But I'm a little weird. You are a little weird, Dee. And then, so, a couple things that I really kind of outlined was he said, and I quote, we don't save things because they are beautiful. We save them because we don't know why and if they matter yet. Hmm. And so, when you encounter something in your house or your yard or your, your garden, you shouldn't ask, how can I kill this? Right. But you should ask, what good is this thing going to do? And you may not even know it. Right. I think often you don't know it. But here's the thing. I encounter snakes in my garden, and people freak out about that. But I have never encountered, in all the years I've lived out here and gardened out here, I've never encountered a poisonous snake. Even though there are poisonous snakes in Oklahoma, they don't live in my garden. I have king snakes. And I have those small brown snakes in the beginning of spring. And I have a green rough snake that lives out here. And my attitude is, if they aren't going to harm me, I'm not going to harm them. So, yes, occasionally I kill wasps because they sting me. But otherwise, I leave them alone, too, even though they're one of my least favorite insects, as you know. And the other thing he made a point of is sometimes when we try to get rid of something just for the sake of getting rid of it, then a bad thing moves in in its place. Yeah, there's some story about mill moths in Germany. Yeah, well, that's a story of we don't know what good it causes, but the mill moth in Germany, which is a problem in grains, it it uh, feeds on grains and things like that, is they found out that it's inside the gut of those moths that the um, Bacillus, Bacillus yeah. thuringiensis, which is called BT, yeah, that's the bacteria that people put on their lawns to kill grubs. And But its host for reproduction is that mill moth How in Germany. How weird. Who knew? And also, there, that BT is also used for caterpillars and worms because it's a, it makes them sick and then they die. <laughs> But you want to be careful and not just put it everywhere in the garden because you might kill beneficial caterpillars. And back to those wasps that I don't like. Right. And that was the other point he made is we, we kill off, you know, um, we kill off beneficial bacteria and things and we end up killing good bacteria and then it allows the bad bacteria of which there are far fewer species, he said. And that's been a bit of a problem. Yeah, it's a problem. That's why people don't use antibacterial soap anymore, hand soap. But back to wasps, you know, wasps, primarily their diet is caterpillars and worms. And so if you have a healthy ecosystem, you don't want to kill off all of your, you don't want to kill off all of your worms and caterpillars because then the wasps don't have anything to eat And the birds don't have anything to eat. So it goes, you know, it's just one big food web, and you have to be conscious of that. And as for mycorrhizae, we've talked about it before. The mycorrhizae, you know, if you want to increase it in your own garden, use compost. Whatever kind of compost there is. Like, in my case, I use a lot of shredded leaves, and that leaf mold has mycorrhizae in it. And it's mycorrhizae that is specific to my land, which is important. But we don't know exactly why all of this is important, but it comes back to, like, the monarch butterflies. I mean, people save the monarch butterflies because they think they're beautiful and because they are a particularly American butterfly. And I don't mean just America. I mean the Americas. And they are also found a couple other places in the world. But there are butterfly, but you shouldn't be saving them just because they're pretty. Does that make sense? You should plant for them. Because, right. Yeah. Because, you should, go ahead. They're they're part of a balanced ecosystem, and so I think as gardeners, we should look to see how can we balance the ecosystem in our garden, and you know, planting a diverse uh, amount of plant material. A lot of it native. Mine is not strictly all native, but Mine planting either. a diverse amount of of plant material, and then not freaking out at the first bug. And grabbing a spray of some kind to try to kill it. But try to figure out 
what's not in balance in my my ecosystem that's causing this thing to just go berserk right because a lot of people don't understand like i tomato hornworms are a good example and there's a small wasp that lays its eggs in them and so a lot of times if you can stand the fact that you've got a tomato hornworm on one tomato plant and you just move all the hornworms to that tomato plant i promise you before long you will see little egg cases for those wasps on those on because the because the ecosystem is set up to take care of itself. I I haven't used a pesticide in my garden I don't know, 10 years, 12 years, long long time, maybe longer. Because I tell people, you know, again going back to vegetables, I can buy pesticide-laden vegetables at the gar- at the grocery store anytime I want. So in my garden we don't use those chemicals. Right. And even in an ornamental garden, if you aren't growing food, you are killing all kinds of other creatures if you are spraying pesticides. So right. just don't. You don't need them. Just plant a diverse palette. And you will. I promise you, you will have the right kind of bugs. And birds will come in and they eat the bugs and everything. Everyone is happy. It really is kind of a little paradise, except for the dang weeds. Well, speaking of paradises, I did mention that it is uh, very lovely in Indiana, mm-hmm. and so I want to go out to my paradise for a while. Much as I love talking with you, Dee. Love talking to you, too. It's time to say goodbye and tell our listeners where can they find us. Our listeners can find us. They can send us emails, and we have been getting emails and enjoying them and responding back to you at thegardenangelus at gmail.com. They can find us on Facebook on our facebook page they can find us on instagram either individually or at the garden angelus and they can find us on twitter if you'd like to download this podcast you can go to a variety of places to download it if you don't understand how to download a podcast get your 13 year old grandson nephew friend down the street to tell you that's that about covers it so until next week d it was great chatting with you over the garden gate And same with you. I'm heading outside now. See you later. Bye. Bye.